Galatians chapter 3. Let's pray together. Father, thank you that we have this privilege to spend time in your word worshiping you. Help us to revel in your promises and your faithfulness. In Jesus' name, amen. We live in a world of broken promises. People often make promises they do not keep. I don't know if you know this, but we're in election season. (laughs) Have you noticed? Did you notice any of that? There'll be promises and promises and promises about walls and people and money and all kinds of other stuff. Do you remember this promise from a number of years ago? Read my lips. No new taxes. You remember that one? The next president after him made another promise in 1996. President Bill Clinton said, The era of big government is over. (laughs) How'd that one work out for us? Ten years earlier, President Reagan made this statement. We did not, repeat, did not trade weapons or anything else for hostages, nor will we. If you know anything about the Iran-Contra affair, you know that that was not truthful. 22 years earlier, Lyndon B. Johnson made a promise on the campaign trail. He wrote, or said, we are not about to send American boys nine or 10,000 miles away from home to do what Asian boys ought to be doing for themselves. Well, we know that that fatally did not come to pass, and thus the Vietnam War took place, and some of you know all of the ramifications, or many ramifications from that. Whether or not these presidents intended to keep their promises is not of greatest issue to us, The promises of men, they're not the same as the promises of God. Not the same, not at all. When God promises something, we can be assured of its fulfillment, for God's promise is based upon His impeccable character. As we move through Galatians chapter 3 this morning, this next section, we will try to understand the relationship between the law and the promises of God. The relationship between the law and the promises of God. First of all, we want to notice this. The law did not change the nature of God's promise. The law did not change the nature of God's promise. What is tempting for some, maybe not for us, uh, is to see that when the law came, That was a new way in which God would bless His people. Now, there were, as you remember, blessings and cursings for keeping the law. You saw that in Deuteronomy 27 and 28. In fact, there was this big kind of ceremonial thing going on. Some people were on one mountain, others on the other, and they would kind of echo back and forth the cursings and the blessings. So we know that the law brought its own blessings and cursings, but not the ones that were based upon the character, and nature of God. What we cannot see is the law replacing promise as the way that God brings about the ultimate fulfillment of His purposes. In Galatians 3, we want to start reading in verse 15 to understand from these first four verses, 15 to 18, that the law did not change the nature of God's promise. Verse 15. To give a human example, brothers... Even with a man-made covenant, no one annuls it or adds to it once it has been ratified. Now the promises were made to Abraham and to his offspring. It does not say, and to offsprings, referring to many, but referring to one, and to your offspring, who is Christ. This is what I mean. The law, which came 430 years after, does not annul a covenant previously ratified by God so as to make the promise void. For if the inheritance comes by the law, it no longer comes by promise. But God gave it to Abraham by a promise. So we have this section, and it's it's interesting. It it helps us to, to bring into a further understanding what 
Paul, under the inspiration of the Spirit, has been telling the Galatians, and it's this. Justification, a right standing before God, the removal of our sin, the addition of Jesus' righteousness, the justification comes not by adherence to the law, but by faith in Jesus Christ. And so he, he takes that and now he applies it to the situation at hand because there are people that are trying to mingle the law in with justification and sanctification and glorification as if we contribute in some way to our right standing before God. And what the Bible tells us and what Paul is emphatic at in the book of Galatians is that our standing before God is based upon the righteousness of another that is credited to our account. So we have this section. He uses this illustration of a will. He says a human covenant is not able to be annulled once it's been ratified. In other words, you can change your will up until the point of death. But once death comes, there's no more changing the will. It's over. It's all over. What is written is written, and it shall not be changed. He uses this as an illustration of this concept. So with that in mind, I want for us to answer a couple of questions because verse 18 introduces this statement. It says, for if the inheritance comes by the law, it no longer comes by promise, but God gave it to Abraham by promise. And so he's letting us know that this section is letting us, that, that this section is informing us that God doesn't change the way that we obtain the promise. So head back with me to the book of Genesis chapter 15. Genesis chapter 15. What is this promise that is being referred to? What is this covenant? The covenant first is found in Genesis chapter 12. We remember the Abrahamic covenant where God promised Abraham a land, a seed, and a blessing, and really a, a multiplication that, that reaches out to the nations beyond Abraham, it's a, a worldwide application because through his seed, Abraham's seed, all the nations of the earth would be blessed. So there's the, the covenant made, the promise made in Genesis 12. How was it ratified? That's a very important question. How was it brought into its, its full agreement? And that's what we have in Genesis 15. And it's a beautiful thing. It's, it's, actually, it's actually a little bit morbid because we don't really do things like this. When you made your last uh, agreement to pay the bank for your house, did you, did you take some animals and cut them up and line them up and then you and the, the, the banker walked through the, the dead animals? You didn't, you didn't do that? I wonder why. Well, that's what they used to do to ratify a covenant. And so here we have God making a promise to Abraham, Genesis 12, reiterating that promise time and again and as a way of bringing it into full contract form. God allows us to see this ceremony that really is like a, a signing of a guarantee. In Genesis chapter 15 and verse 1, the Bible says this, After these things, the word of the Lord came to Abram in a vision. Fear not, Abram, I am your shield. Your reward shall be very great. Now the word shall be is added into our Bibles. It's not in the Hebrew. It's a fine thing to say. You can read it that way. I don't read it that way. I would skip those words. What you could read is, your reward, very great. Okay? So if you, if you think about this and apply it to the first part of the sentence, what he says is, fear not, Abram. I am your shield, your reward, very great. And the way that our King James and New King James Bibles translate it is, I am your shield, your exceedingly great reward. I am your exceedingly great reward. I'm your shield, I'm your protector, and I am your reward. And we see that concept through the Old Testament numerous times with a different word. He says, I am your portion, or you are our portion. We recognize that any promise that God makes, while there may be many stages to them, the ultimate reward that we look to is not this land or this temporal blessing. The ultimate reward is God himself. And Abraham understands this. David understood this. The psalmist understood that God was the ultimate reward. With that in mind, just by way of just a quick application in our own minds, if you don't want God as your reward, 
you don't have Jesus as your Savior. If God's not enough for you, you've come to the wrong place. If Jesus is your Savior, on the other hand, God is your reward. He's your treasure. He's your inheritance. Now, in addition to that ultimate prize, there are other blessings along the way that God's people gain. In fact, the very nature of the Abrahamic covenant adds other blessings into it, particularly the land of promise. And so Abram asks God in verses 2 through 5, there's this interchange between God and, and Abram, basically saying, I don't have a child. How am I going to have this reward? And God says, it's not going to be through Eleazar of your household. He's not your own son. I'm going to give you a son. Now verse 5. Verse 5 of Genesis 15. And he brought him outside and said, look toward heaven and number the stars if you're able to number them, which, of course, we know we couldn't. Then he said to him, so shall your offspring be. And he believed the Lord. And he, God, counted it to him, Abraham, as righteousness. God accredited to Abraham righteousness because he believed the word of God. Now, the context, verse 7. And he said to him, I am the Lord who brought you out, of, out from Ur of the Chaldeans to give you this land to possess. So there's the, the promise of this context. I'm giving you this land to possess. But he said, oh Lord, how am, I, how am I to know that I shall possess it? And he said to him, bring me a heifer three years old, a female goat three years old, a ram three years old, a turtle dove, and a young pigeon. And he brought him all these cut them in half, and laid each half over against the other, but he did not cut the birds in half. And when the birds of prey came down on the carcasses, Abram drove them away. This is a very, very interesting tidbit there. It's like he could have left that out, but for some reason, God, the Spirit, intended for us to have that information. There's a lot of speculation as to what these birds are all about. Just know this. Whenever God has you doing something, there will be interruptions in the flow. What the cause of that interruptions are, sometimes it's the world, sometimes it's our own flesh, and sometimes it's the devil. The reality is, here's Abram doing what God said, taking these animals, laying them out, and the reason was because in those days, in order to bring a covenant to full ratification, they would cut these animals in pieces, they would, both parties, both parts of the agreement, they would walk through the, the midst of these divided animals, and here's the picture that's being presented if I don't keep my part of the covenant, may this and more happen to me. In other words, cut me in half. Kill me if I don't keep my covenant. That's the picture that's being brought to pass here. Verse, 11, uh, verse 12 now. As the sun was going down, a deep sleep fell on Abram. And behold, dreadful and great darkness fell upon him. Then the Lord said to Abram, Know for sure, know for certain, that your offspring will be sojourners in a land that is not theirs and will be servants there and they will be afflicted for 400 years. But I will bring judgment on the nation that they serve and afterward they shall come out with great possessions. As for you, you shall go to your fathers in peace and you shall be buried in a good old age. And they shall come back here in the fourth generation for the iniquity of the Amorites is not yet complete. Oh, just another little pause, okay? Indulge me just for a second. What is that all about? Could not God have given them the land right then and there? Yes. Why didn't he? Because God endures long even with unregenerate people. He would not take their land from them and judge them until they reached the limit. When their cup of sin filled up to overflowing, God said, now you can have the land. It's very interesting. It's a, it's a little point of God's faithfulness even to those that don't know him. Those who are enemies of God still have God's long-suffering demonstrated to them, and we see it in our world today, don't we? Moving forward, verse 17. When the sun had gone down and it was dark, behold, a smoking fire pot and a flaming torch passed between these pieces. 
on that day, the Lord made a covenant with Abram, saying, To your offspring I give this land from the river of Egypt to the great river, the river Euphrates, the land of the Kenites, the land of the Kenizzites, the land of the Cadmonites, the Hittites, the Perizzites, the Rephaim, the Amorites, the Canaanites, the Girgashites, and the Jebusites. We've got all these great names that we could really have fun talking about. The point is not about the ites. The point is that God, in this visionary form, the flaming pot go and torch walk, goes through the divided pieces. Where's Abraham? Off to the side over there sleeping. What does that tell you about this covenant? Only one party went through. The covenant's not based upon Abraham. It's based upon God himself. The covenant that God made to Abraham is based upon God's very own character. To whom was the promise made? It was to Abraham and to his singular seed. In Genesis chapter 3, verses 16 and 19, it tells us who that seed is. We know him. His name is Jesus. So the promise was made to Abraham and to Jesus... We're going to come back, hopefully, to understand why he's saying to Jesus and how that relates to us. How does that relate to us? If the promise is made to Jesus, well, well, does it have anything to do with me? The answer to that is yes. You can steal some thunder and say, because you're in Jesus, if you know Christ. So the promise is to you. Take a look now at Hebrews chapter 6. Hebrews chapter 6, we already read this this morning, but it is of utmost importance as God tells us that he is a covenant-keeping God, a promise-keeping God. He never violates his word. He always acts in accordance with the truth. He makes a promise. He fulfills a promise. The law came after this promise. The law does not annul the promise. The promise was based not upon Abraham's performance or Isaac's performance or Jacob's performance, or any of the 12 sons of Jacob's performance, the sons of Israel. It's not on their children's performance. It's based upon the very character and nature of God. And God's character and nature doesn't change. Never, 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 and again I say never. God's character doesn't change. Hebrews chapter 6 and verse 13 For when God made a promise to Abraham, since he had no one greater by whom to swear, he swore by himself. God says, I promise. Not on my mother's grave. Not on this Bible. Not on the stone over there. I swear. That's the end of the story. Because when God says yes, it's yes. And when God says no, it's no. Everything God says comes to pass. He doesn't speak frivolously. Verse 14, saying, Surely I will bless you and multiply you. And thus Abram, Abraham, having patiently waited, obtained the promise. For people swear by something greater than themselves. And in all their disputes, an oath is final for confirmation. Verse 17, So when God desired to show more convincingly to the heirs of the promise, the unchangeable character of his purpose, he guaranteed it with an oath, so that by two unchangeable things in which it is impossible, impossible for God to lie, we who have fled for refuge might have strong encouragement to hold fast to the hope set before us. In other versions, the word immutable is used. Immutable. He doesn't change. So God offers to Abraham this promise. 430 years later, the law comes. And sometimes people think, if I do this, God will bless me with this. And the reality is, the blessing was not promised in accordance with law keeping. It was all about believing the promise. The the promise is based upon God's unchanging, unviolable, impeccable character. This is good news, folks. This is good news. Head back to Galatians chapter 3. Galatians chapter 3. So we have this covenant language in verses 15 through 18. 
Now he introduces another question that should be logical. Okay, if the promise is not affected by the law, then why bother giving us the law? What is the purpose of the law? That is our next question, and here's our next statement. The law was given for the good of God's people. The law was given for the good of God's people. Look at verse 19. Why then the law? It was added because of transgressions until the offspring should come to whom the promise had been made. And it was put in place through angels by an intermediary. Now an intermediary implies more than one, but God is one. Now I was trying to figure out how in the world do we talk about that portion here of this law coming through the intermediary of angels. And, and then it talks about uh, an intermediary implies more than one, but God is one. What is he talking about? Here's what we've got as, as a, just a little nugget. When the promise came, it was God and Abraham, and that's it. When the law came, if you look at the book of Acts, if you look in the book of Hebrews, we see that the law came to Moses through the intermediary um, bringing mediation of the angels. And so you've got God and angels and Moses, and then Moses brings it to the people. You've got all these parties involved. Not so with the promise. The promise went from God to Abraham, and that's it. We're just looking at the, the reality that promise is better than law. Promise is better than law. You don't need other parties involved. The promise comes from God. It's as good as sealed. All right, with that being said, the law was given for the good of God's people. Take a look at Deuteronomy chapter 10. Now, you know a bit about the book of Deuteronomy you know that there's a lot of reiteration that goes on in the book of, of Deuteronomy. It's like you, you take what's been said in Exodus, Leviticus, and Numbers, and, and you've got a lot of restatements. And the reason is, it's the Deuteronomy is Deuteros Nominus, the second giving of the law. As the people spent their sojourn in the wilderness and they were about to head into the promised land, God says, I want to remind you of all the things I told you. And so we have the restating of the law. And with that, God gives us some great insight about why he gave us the law. Many times he's talking about how God intended the law to come from the heart as opposed to the form. That comes up regularly in the book of Deuteronomy. But here I want you to just catch one little nugget from Deuteronomy 10, verses 12 and 13. It's, it's, it's a very helpful statement. Verse 12, And now, Israel, what does the Lord your God require of you but to fear the Lord your God? to walk in all His ways, to love Him, to serve the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul, and to keep the commandments and the statutes of the Lord. Listen carefully. Which I am commanding you today. What's the rest of that say? For your good. For your good. For your good. Keep that in mind. The law was given for the good of God's people. When, this is the great thing about trusting God. When you understand who God is and you trust Him, you know that He knows what's best. The law was given because life works best this way. Now, let's use a little illustration of that. You have children... You remember, maybe you have children actively, or maybe your children are, are grown, but you remember, we have rules in our house. We don't eat candy for breakfast. Why? Because it's not good for you. It's not because we're mean. By the way, just a little side note, apple crisp is not candy. <laughs> just saying. And when you eat apple crisp, and you're having it for breakfast... You need dairy. Dairy is a good part of yeah. breakfast, right? And if you have warm apple crisp, the kind of dairy that you have with it, generally speaking, would be vanilla ice cream. I'm just saying. We don't eat candy for breakfast because it's not good for us. It's not because we're mean ogres parents and, and we don't want you to have that which is so deli delicious to you. 
It's not good for you. You're going to be hyperactive. You're not going to have the sustenance you need to get you through the day. It's, it only lasts a short little spurt of sugar burst, and then you're done. It's not good for you. That's why we have that law. It's how life works better. We don't allow our children to, to have unfettered, timeless amounts of time on media devices. Why? Because we're mean, and we don't want them to, to, uh, to have fun. No, because life works better when there are limits on things, because we would waste all kinds of time and corrupt our, our already corrupted minds more corruptly. There, life works better this way. That's one of the reasons God gave us the law, because it, it helps us to, to see how life works. Well, there's other reasons as well. The law sets God's people apart. The law sets God's people apart. You remember in the book of 1 John chapter 2, where the apostle John tells his his beloved children, love not the world or the things that are in the world for everything that is in the world is the lust of the flesh and the lust of the eyes and the pride of life. These are not of the Father. They're not going to last forever. But he who does the will of the Father, that's, that's eternal. You've got that, that concept that he gives there in 1 John 2, 15 through 17. God wants, he knows what's best for us. Let, let's think about it this way. Let, let's suppose we all said, Okay. Jesus came, so the law is completely abrogated. There, there's, there's no such thing as the Ten Commandments. And so I can kill people, be fine. I can covet my, my neighbor's wife. I can bear false witness. I can have as many idols as I want because the, the law is abrogated, right? It's all gone. I don't, it just, none of that stuff matters anymore. Jesus came. Is that what God meant when he says that Jesus fulfilled the law? No. It's not that, that now we can just sin uh, un, unchecked without any thought. That's not the concept. It's that the keeping of the law does not gain us approval with God. Keeping the law doesn't bring God's blessing. The blessing comes through Christ. That's what it means. If we are just like the world in every way, what do we have to offer them? Listen, we, we remove every possible way, that, that thing that makes us distinctive. What are we actually offering the world? Nothing. Nothing. There, there are some people that go that way. And they're like, oh, you know, none of that, all that stuff is just hogwash. That's all man-made stuff. And, and so they just live like everyone else because they want everyone to feel comfortable around them. And you know what happens is they just get ignored. Because if you're just like me, why do I have to bother adding that to my life? I got enough stuff in my life without adding that. I want to go bowling instead. It's more fun. Oh. There's, a, there's something that, that's distinctive. The law sets God's people apart. But here's, here's the greatest purpose of the law, and this is what Paul's argument really drives us to. The law points out our sin. The law points out our sin. Why the law then? Because of transgression. Take a look, please, with me at Romans chapter 7. Romans chapter 7. a really great passage of Scripture to help understand why God gave us the law. Beginning in verse 7 of Romans chapter 7, the Bible says, What then shall we say? That the law is sin? By no means. Yet, if it had not been for the law, I would not have known sin. For I would not have known what it is to covet, if the law hath not said or had not said, you shall not covet. But sin, seizing an opportunity through the commandment, produced in me all kinds of covetousness. For apart from the law, sin lies dead. I was once alive apart from the law, but when the commandment came, sin came alive and I died the very commandment that promised life proved to be death to me. For sin, seizing an opportunity through the commandment, deceived me, and through it killed me. So the law is holy, and the commandment is holy and righteous and good. Did that which is good then bring death to me? By no means. It was sin 
producing death in me through what is good in order that sin, listen carefully, that sin might be shown to be sin and through the commandment or, and, and that through the commandment might become sinful beyond measure. So he, here's what he says. Before the commandment comes, I'm sinning. I'm sinning, but I don't know it. So I feel fine. When the commandment comes, the knowledge of sin comes. When the knowledge of sin comes, the knowledge of the consequences of sin comes. When the knowledge of the consequences of sin comes, I recognize I am in a, a desperate situation. Which is why in Galatians 3.19, he says, why the, why the law? It was added because of transgression. It was added because you were a sinner and you needed to realize how desperately sinful you really are. Listen carefully. The biggest favor the law has done for us is to show us our helplessness. The biggest favor the law has done for us is to show us our helplessness. Oh, I can try really hard to do this. And you know what happens? I find myself failing time and again. And it shows me to be helpless and ultimately hopeless. The biggest favor the law does for us is to show us our inadequacy. All right. That being said, head back to Galatians chapter 3. The law does not change God's promise because the promise was based upon His character. The law was given for the good of God's people. Because life works better that way, because it sets God's people apart, and because law points out our sin or our inadequacy. So, as we move to the last section of this subsection, the law paves the way for embracing God's promises. The law paves the way for embracing God's promises. Look again at Galatians 3, look, starting in verse 22. But the Scripture imprisoned everything under sin. The whole world. He said it differently in Romans. He says that all the world may become guilty. The Scriptures, the understanding of Scriptures, the understanding of the law, the understanding of God's written record helps us to recognize that we are all under sin. That's what he tells us. So that... The promise by faith in Jesus Christ might be given to those who believe. And so we have this, this, the law coming and it making us feel like this so that we'll look like this so that we'll recognize that we need this and ultimately we're with God. I know that there's a lot of um, non-defined terms in the this and the that, right? But the law comes to make us helpless to recognize that there is help from Him through Jesus Christ, and that by embracing Jesus Christ, I then have what the law can never give me, which is life. Which He just told us in verse 21. Take a look back at verse 21. Is the law then contrary to the promises of God? Certainly not. For if a law had been given that could give life, then righteousness would indeed be by the law. And it didn't. The, the law didn't bring life. It only brought condemnation. It brought real, realization of sinfulness. It brought a pathway to faith in Christ. It brought a pathway for us to embrace the gospel of Jesus Christ. Look at verse 6 of the same chapter, Galatians 3, 6. He's already proven this point. Just as Abraham believed God, and it, that belief, counted to him was counted to him as righteousness. Well, the righteousness comes from believing the word of God and God himself. So righteousness comes by believing what God says. That righteousness gives life and union with God. We clear on that? The law can't do that. That's his whole point. The law can't bring about this righteousness that gives life. Verse 23. Now before faith came, we were held captive under the law, imprisoned until the coming faith would be revealed. And so he uses these very vivid words. He talks about being held captive and imprisoned. By what? The law. 
What's it doing? It's oppressing us. It is, it is showing us how vile we are from the inside out. It's showing us what God knows about us from Jeremiah 17.9, that the heart of man is what? Deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. God knows this, but sometimes we don't. When we come to the realization of who we really are, it drives us, it drives us to a solution. Why are many people not seeking Christ today? Because they don't know the wickedness of their heart and the consequence of that wickedness. So they're seeking satisfaction somewhere else. We recognize that we can't get satisfaction anywhere else but Christ because we recognize how desperately wicked we are and what the consequence of that wickedness is. And so it drives us to the one solution that will give us righteousness instead of wickedness and life instead of death. In other words, we are held captive, from verse 23, we are held captive by the law until faith's target was unveiled. What is that target? It was always Christ. They didn't always know. They didn't have a clear picture all the time in the Old Testament what, they were, what the, the full blossoming of their understanding of God's Word was, but it was always the target was Christ and He was unveiled. Verse 24, so then, that's, that's like one of those in summary. So then, the law was our guardian until Christ came in order that we might be justified by faith. So, what does the law do? You know, a guardian, and we're going to talk more about this in two weeks or a few weeks when we get to Genesis, uh, Galatians chapter 4. It talks about guardians again. But when a, when a, a person of wealth had children in their homes, a lot of times they would have servants in the house that they paid to raise their children. And those, those servants in their house that were raising their children would, would guide the children and teach them things that they needed to know so that they, when they got to adulthood, they were ready to act like this family name ought to be like. So they're, they're learning all of these things. And the law was like one of those. It's teaching us this is what life is supposed to look like when faith comes, when faith comes, we do what God commands. Well, I try to say that all the time, don't I? In Galatians chapter 5 and verse 16, walk in the Spirit, you will not fulfill the lust of the flesh. We, we talk about uh, Romans chapter 8 and verse 14, that in us the righteous requirements of the law will be fulfilled when we walk not after the flesh but after the Spirit. So, the law is not useless. The law is not pointless. The law is good. The law is not bad. Even though it makes us feel bad. Even though it shows us our inadequacy, the law is not bad. It's good if it is used lawfully. The law does not change the nature of God's promise. The law points out our sin and our inability and our need. At this valuable juncture, when we recognize our need, we're ready to hear what God has done through promise. So the question is, the last question of the morning, what has He done? What has He done to bring about the promise? Well, in Christ, we all know the Christmas story. Jesus, born of the Virgin Mary, we know He grew up. Luke chapter 2 tells us that he, he grew in wisdom and in stature and in favor with God and man. As you look through his life, he perfectly fulfilled the law of God. I didn't, and I don't. You didn't, and we can't. But Jesus did. He fulfilled the law in our stead. He laid down his life as a payment for our sin. This is what He has done. He was raised in victory as the firstborn, listen carefully, as the firstborn of many brothers. What has the promise done? What has God done? Well, He, he, he substituted someone to do 
rightly what we could never do, to bear our sin, which we could never bear, to be raised up, telling us that this is the first of many brothers who will be raised up to life, never to die again. And God joined us to Jesus as joint heirs. Joint heirs. So here's a question. I know I said I wasn't going to ask any more, but I lied. Don't tell anyone. <laughs> Don't tell the people that are listening. What, what does Jesus inherit? Everything. What is it? Everything. All things. If you've trusted Jesus as your Savior, you're a joint heir with him? What is your inheritance? All things. Hmm. The promise that came to Abraham and to his seed, who is Christ. And guess what? When we come to faith in Christ, we're united with Christ. The blessings that Jesus receives, all those who are in him receive. Could you get a better promise than that? Could you? Well, I would just really want a car. Really? I just really want to be well. Really? I just want to have enough to pay my bills. Really? You want to settle for that? This life only lasts just so long. You know it. You see people come and go. What God is offering you is far better than anything you could ever receive. It's a promise. And it's a promise based upon His character, not us. You want a future that is bountiful and guaranteed? Trust in Jesus Christ. Trust Him. What He has done in fulfilling the law in your place, dying to pay for your sin, that you might receive the adoption as sons and be heir of all things with Jesus. God's promise can be yours through Jesus. Let's pray. Father, thank you. Thank you that your promises are sure. Others' promises, not so much. Your promises are sure. And you've promised us everything through Jesus. We know in this life, it doesn't always feel like we have everything. Sometimes we feel down about things that we're lacking. We ask that you'd help us to be satisfied with our future, our future in Christ, our future with you. We know there will be no disappointments then. We know that we'll be full and overflowing. We'll joy and rejoice in your presence forever because of Jesus. Help us. Help us to trust you, to believe you. And we pray for anyone here that does not know the joy of knowing your word is sure and of knowing Jesus as Lord and Savior. We pray even in these moments that you might turn their gaze upon you, that they too would be heir of all things would be full and overflowing with joy because of their relationship with you through Jesus. Do this work, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen.